Welcome to the Do Hard Things podcast with your host, General John, uh, where we believe that your best self is found on the other side of doing hard things. Today, we have one of the biggest, if not the biggest goat in solar, Mr. Mike Brand himself. Mike has done over 1,000 personal installs, which for me actually what's even more impressive than that is that Mike on top of that has built remarkable, extraordinary sales team. He's been in the, he's been in the industry for over a decade and he Don't truly age is. Don't age me, dude. Don't age me. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no. He's 25. He started when he was 15. But he is an individual though that I believe has accomplished remarkable things in this space and has earned multiple millions of dollars in commissions and helped also raise up many, many six-figure earners and seven-figure earners. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Bro. Yeah, dude. Dude, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, I'm from um, from Sacramento originally. So born and raised in Sacramento and um, grew up and had no idea what I wanted to do for a living, really no clue. And in high school, I got into basketball and played basketball four years in high school. And that's where I got kind of my competitive juices flowing. And also um, my basketball coach was one of my earliest mentors. Mm. His name's Dave Milholland, uh, really good guy. Uh, but he really focused on like team and unity and like um, performance equals PC. He'd say P equals PC. We want your performance to equal your performance capability. So he started to shape um, the wow. way that I think. And um, man, it's just such a blessing to like be able to be on that team and, and be under his um, kind of stewardship. Um, out of high school, I got some pretty serious jobs like delivering groceries. Um, I was a pizza delivery man Come on. Uh, for round table, round table to this day. Papa Mike. Hey, <laughs> call me Papa Mike. Still my favorite pizza place by far, round table pizza. And I kind of bounced around and was doing some junior college classes and just really no direction. And then my friend, Akoni Berman, shout out Akoni. Uh, I don't know where you are, what you're doing, but I love you, dude. Um, he introduced me to selling home security mm. for a company called APX at the time. And this is the summer of 2009. And he invited me out, I was in Sacramento, he invited me out to San Jose. And um, I, I got out there and I saw these guys in like shorts and flip flops and APX was a summer sales program. And they're already about halfway through the summer, so guys were selling. And um, I went out and my first day knocking ever, I shadowed one day and saw one sale. Um, my first day ever knocking was a Friday and my second day was a Saturday. They dropped me off in hood. I had my like sandals and flip flops on. I was 20, oh, 22 years old, right? Just with not a worry in the world, like so confident, like overconfident, right? And I go out and 12 hours each day, like nine to nine. Wow. Each day, didn't get in one house. And I remember coming home that Saturday night and me and Coney were in an apartment and pulling up like APX Insider. And I looked, they have their scoreboard, right? And I looked and there was this guy, his name was Jordan Williams. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have heard of him, he's a legend. He works for Sunrun now, but guy's a stud. He was the top ever alarm salesman for APX and Vivint. And he had done 18 that week, 18 sales. I had just knocked 24 hours straight essentially yeah. <laughs> and gotten in zero homes. Wow. And so for anyone that's new in sales, you know, this might resonate with you, but your first thought is bullshit. Hmm. Is like, that guy is cheating. Yeah. <laughs> He's lying to people. Like, there, I just did this. Like, I, I, thought that. Yep, I, I thought knocked that. really hard, John. I got nothing. And so that was like my first kind of like thought. You go into like self protection mode and defense mode and like excuse making, right? And that's yeah. kind of the natural human thought and emotion. And then something just clicked. And in my head, I said, wait a second. Dude, I, this is bullshit. Like, why am I telling myself this story? Wow. This guy is talking to the same people I'm talking to. And he's no smarter than me. He's just more skilled. He has more experience. But I really believed I could learn anything. And so that next Monday, I went out and I knocked all day. And I, I'll never forget it. On my last door of the night at like 8.30 p.m., I got into a house and I made my first sale ever. Come on. Commission was like 400 bucks. Okay, you only get half up front. Yeah. The office dissolved. But I'm like, sure to you that was a big deal. Dude, 
It was more than the money, more, right? Yeah, exactly. It was just knowing you could do it. It was that attitude. It was that like belief. It was like, instead of saying, hey, it's bullshit that this guy did 18, no one can do that. It was yeah. like, hey, who are the three people that he's talking to today? Or that I'm talking to today, rather, that Jordan Williams would have sold. Yeah. And once I had that mindset, then things started falling into place. Wow. And so every day I went out and I got one sale that week. Yeah. And we were in San Jose and I'll never forget it, but at the end of the week, Rich Tinker's running the office. He's like, hey guys, we're moving to Virginia. We're like switching markets, you know, cause San Jose was like such a tough market. We're moving to Virginia and he's like, we only have 10 spots. You know, he like wrote it up on the board, like, like they're not gonna bring everyone, you know? But I'm just like, I'm not going to Virginia. Like I know these guys two weeks, like I'm out, you know? So I moved back to Sacramento and I ended up getting a, um, getting a job at Monotronics. And that's where I really cut my teeth um, van program going out every day, started selling 30 alarms a month, started reading sales trainings, um, and did that for, um, you know, I don't know, four or five, six months. Um, by the end of that, going into December, I got recruited back to APX and Vivint uh, by a guy named Curtis Wills, and I ended up going and selling for three summers for Vivint. Um, APX changed their name to Vivint, and that's where I really cut my teeth and, and started selling. Um, you know, my first summer I went out and made six figures and I'm like, is this real life? No college education, yeah. used to deliver pizzas and now I'm making six figures. Wow. I that was what, 20 or 23 then? That, yeah, I was 23 years old. Wow. This is 2010. I mean, that's big for a 23 year old, right? Dude, to it's, make it's six crazy. figures. Dude, I remember seeing like 10 or 15 grand in my bank account and I was yeah. like, yeah. I've made it, dude. Like I'm rich, yeah. <laughs> 10 grand, are you serious? But we did that for three summers. Um, by the end of the third summer, by the end of the third summer, um, I had heard about the opportunity in solar. This is late 2012. And so I actually moved from summer, I moved out to New Jersey um, for Vivint Solar. And at the time they only had four markets, like nationwide, they have four offices. Yeah. Solar was in its infancy. This is a decade ago. And so I started selling solar in 2012 um, in New Jersey um, for Vivint Solar. And that's where I really cut my teeth selling solar and kind of got in the weeds. It was very early on in the market. Um, 2013, I opened up the first market for Vivint Solar on Long Island. And from 2013 to 2016, we were the number one office in the company. Wow. Just dominated. We were doing 600 installs a quarter, 2,500 installs a year. I was averaging 50 installs personally. We had an 80 man team. We were just cranking. Yeah. Um, my wife got pregnant with our third. So we had our two boys in New York, um, Luke and David, and then she got pregnant with our third, Genevieve. And we decided we want to move back west. My wife's from Utah. She's amazing. I married way up. She's awesome. Um, but we went, we moved back to California. So we moved back to San Diego in 2016. So I've been in San Diego from 2016 to present. So what's that? Seven years, seven eight years. years. Yeah. Oof, such fast. a such an impressive background, you know, you have. And one thing that uh, I want to touch on is you, you know, you mentioned that your first mentor was in basketball. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've seen a correlation between guys who have a strong athletic background. Yeah. Tend to do really well in sales because I really do think um, what you were exposed to at a young age it it shapes who you are as an adult. Definitely. So can you touch on what are some of the things you learned through your mentor, through basketball, yeah. that you now apply in sales? Because sales is competitive, right? Yeah. Sales, there's a scoreboard, right? And you're in, you're an individual who has one of the highest scores out there. Yeah. You know, and I believe it's because you still see it, you see it as a sport, right? You see yourself as an athlete in this space and that's why you have the results that you have. So what are some things like maybe even people that are athletes that they're like, man, I want to try sales. You know, what are some things you took from that experience that you now applied here that's making you crazy money? Yeah. Well, I think number one, work ethic, right? There's only two ways to make more money in sales. That's it. There's two ways. Work harder, like talk to more people, work harder or get better like become more efficient, right? And so I think during my basketball career, the thing that I took away was uh, uh, just an ironclad work ethic. Mm -hmm. Like our coach, we worked out all summer. Like we we did drills every day, we did conditioning every day, we we're the best conditioned team. And so the discipline that he instilled in us, it's like we, we poured over, this is a high school team, and we poured over scouting reports before each game. 
Like he had a full scouting report on the other team and we'd get together. Unity is also a big thing that he taught me, like being part of a team and being part of something bigger than yourself, Yeah, you know? Um, and then one thing that comes to mind, our coach strategically was the exact opposite of how most um, teams operate. Most teams are like, let's run and gun, let's press, let's like play fast. He was like, hey guys, most teams are used to playing fast, so we're gonna limit the number of possessions each game. Hmm. We're gonna take up all 35 seconds of the shot clock, and we're gonna get a great shot with five seconds left in the shot clock. Wow. We're gonna pass up shots at 20 seconds, 15 seconds, because we wanna make them play defense. Teams aren't used to playing defense that long. And so, you know, how does that correlate to sales? Well, I think looking at, looking at kind of like what you're selling and thinking like, okay, what's working? What are most guys doing that's not working? And how can I be different in that space? Like, how can I be more efficient is a good takeaway from that. Like, how can I be more efficient in sales? How can I, um, how can I do things a little bit differently to give me an edge? Yeah. And that's what our coach did. He wasn't scared to kind of go against the grain. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, you know, it's an analogy I've heard that, you know, if you have two people trying to cut a tree down mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they both start, they both start at the same time. Well, eventually the act becomes dull. Right. Right. And one guy is going to be like, no, I'm going to keep working harder. I'm going to keep going faster and faster. But the, as the more, the more and more they go, the act becomes more and more, more and more dull. So they have to exert more energy to get through more where right. the other guy says, you know what? I'm going to actually pause. I'm going to slow down. Yep. I'm going to sharpen the ax, right? I'm going to take time away. But that sharpening is what allows them to actually be able to um, get further because yeah. now their ax throw can, can go uh, through faster. So that guy will cut the tree a lot faster than the guy who just keeps going and doesn't take time. So it kind of reminds me of that. And you're right, I think in sales, sometimes people think you have to like go fast, 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 fast all the time. And there's a time and place for it, right? There's a, there's a season for that, right? Sometimes like, you know, right now we're in a season where it's like fast, 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 fast for solar, right? Because yeah. there literally is a time, a, a time uh, expiration date on kind of what's happening here in California. But then there's times where it's like, no, sometimes you gotta slow down because yep. that's actually how you speed up. Yeah, that makes me think like, so talking about solar, like and, and sales in general, like doesn't matter what you sell. There's two ways to make more money. It's it's work harder and become more efficient. And we talk a lot about like becoming better sales people and become more efficient. And then the work hard thing is just like, people don't talk like practically about it. They're just like work harder, work more hours, but you're like, okay. Right, what does that look like? Yeah, what does it look like? Like how can I actually do that for 13 years straight? Mm. And so I think my biggest like talent has been my mentality on how I've been able to stay consistent over the last 13 years in direct sales. Wow. And what's funny is I didn't realize what I was doing until I listened to an Andrew Huberman podcast, like in the last year or so. I didn't realize that there was like deep psychology around what I was doing. But one thing I learned in my basketball career is, is we talked about like loving to do hard things and like loving the process and the work. Like we're gonna work harder than any other team. Like we love to get together and train and practice and like hit the weight room and condition. Like yeah. that was the process. Like we love that. Like our coach instilled that in us. And so when I started in sales, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to knock doors so that I can like eventually get off the doors and retire. Mm. <laughs> like I'm doing this thing because of this end goal. Or I, I'm, I'm knocking doors, I hate it, but I wanna make $100,000, so I'm gonna get through it. Right from the start, it was like, I love selling. I love knocking doors because 99% of people, they're not willing to do it. And if you're able to adopt this mentality where it's like, I love doing hard things and I wanna outwork everyone because that's who I am and I'm someone who does hard things, that mentality, there's a lot of psychology behind it. Mm. And so it's something that I started from like very early on in sales and then you talk about it and you think about it and you talk about it and you think about it and you talk about it and it just becomes who you are. And people are like, you're a weirdo. You love knocking doors? I'm like, hell yeah. We're outside. We're like in the sun. We have no cap on our commissions. We have a ton of autonomy, right? I'm not behind a, a desk in a cubicle, right? I don't have to work nine to five, right? I get to interact with people and like learn communication skills that'll be with me the rest of my life. Like I love this. Yeah. I love the fact that it's hard because if it weren't hard, they wouldn't pay the commissions that they pay us. Exactly. 
And so what I didn't realize until recently is there's actually science behind talking like that and thinking like that. And, and Andrew Huberman, if you haven't listened to his podcast, like it's the best, but search up um, learning to do hard things or leaning into friction, okay? I think is exactly what it's called, but Huberman leaning into friction. He talks about how when you lean into friction and you really lean into doing hard things and the way you talk about it is positive and you, you love it, like that's how you talk and you think about it, you can actually teach your body to release dopamine during those events. Wow. So it actually like psychologically and mentally, it actually feels good to like go do something really hard. And what's crazy is I did that for a decade without realizing what it was. And then as soon as he said it, I was like, okay, there's two things, right? Work hard and get better at sales. Everyone knows how to get better at sales. You do sales training, you copy the best guys, but like how do you actually teach yourself to work hard? Well, you start there, you start with that mentality. You lean into friction. And so if you're new in sales, lean into friction. Like you chose to do this. Whatever you're selling, it doesn't matter. Like be all in, give 100% and lean into that. Yeah, because we have this culture of people think that you have to like love every second of what you do, right? And you can with the right mentality, right? Like, yeah, knocking doors, like especially in the beginning is not fun. Right, the actual act of knocking doors. But if you have the mentality of, I'm gonna learn the skill set of enjoying to like the friction, that is where uh, the growth is at, you know? Because like you said, you said perfectly, if a lot, if everyone could do this, then it wouldn't pay as well, right? My mentor taught me that my income is always a direct proportion of the problems I solve. Yep. And that's all sells this, right? We are professional problem solvers. That's all we are, professional problem solvers. We solve problems and the bigger problem we solve, the much better the reward, right? right? Solving energy demand, energy crisis, like in solar right now, that's a big problem. Or if you're solving the, uh, hey, I wanna feel safe in my home, you're selling security, right? That's a problem. The bigger problem you solve, the more you get paid, but it's challenging, right. it's hard. Because if, 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 if it was solvable, then we wouldn't need people like you, like me, right. to be able to do it. If it were easy, the income opportunity wouldn't be what it was. Exactly. So like the harder it gets, the harder it gets, the more grateful I am. Yeah. So talking about NEM 3.0 and like this rolling out in California immediately, I was like, yes, yes. great. Because the weak-minded people, Bounce. they're out. Yes. Lumio, out. Can right. I say that? I don't know if I can say that. Lumio, out of California, right? Like the people that just want the path of least resistance and are always looking for that, they'll never make the money that the people um, of the people that are willing to solve the big problems yeah. and like push through hard things, being the bison in the storm, like turning into the storm, yeah. right? And not the little cow that runs with the storm, yeah. right? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, no, and that's a good analogy. One of our friends, he told us that, you know, you can either be a cow or you can be a bison. Don't be a right? cow, man. A cow, when a storm's coming, you know what cows do? They run away from the storm. So the storm is coming and they're running this way. They actually, and then when the storm eventually catches up, they stay caught up in the storm and they stay in there longer. Or a bison, they freaking just go through the storm and then they get through it on the other side a lot faster. Yeah. So be bisons, right? There's a reason why it's called a cow word because you're a cow. Well, and that's, that's any challenge in life. Right, like one thing I'll say to everyone right now that's watching this is if you've either, you're either going through something really hard right now in your life or you will soon, period. Like if, if you assume 80, 90% of the people that you talk to are going through a really hard life challenge or have recently or are going to, you're right. And so the way that this applies is a lot of people run from their problems. They run, they hide um, in every aspect of their life. But if you actually fully own, if you're honest and you fully own your problems, that's where the growth happens. That's where you're actually gonna like get through whatever addiction you're struggling with or whatever you're struggling with in your life. You have to fully face it and own it, period. I'm far from perfect. Like I have my struggles, I've dealt with addiction. And what I've found in my life is like, man, if you face it head on, that's how you're gonna get through it the fastest and that's how you're gonna learn the most. Right, yeah, no, and that's great. And then, you know, in doing hard things, Mike, you've also developed a phenomenal skill set of selling. Now, one thing that when I first met you that really caught my attention and that made me be like, dude, this guy is a freaking master of his craft is you do something a little differently on the door. So, you know, for those guys that are watching that, you know, do door to door sales, whether solar alarms, pest control, whatever, um, you know, what is the one thing you do in the doors that has made you so successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a couple things. I think 
what I'll say is this, just to start out, and this is applicable to any industry. If you wanna double or triple or quadruple or quintuple your sales like immediately, the first thing that you have to do is learn how to name drop effectively and become the mayor of your neighborhood. And that applies to any industry. The guys that are best in the industry, what they do is they cultivate a neighborhood and they know more people than the homeowner. Right. So that's number one. You have to be able to do that and you have to name drop effectively. We did this on another video, but really quick just to cover. I think there's three things that you do to name drop effectively. Instead of just listing homeowners or showing people a list, you want them to feel like you're part of the neighborhood. People are going to be more hesitant to say no to you if they feel like, you know, the neighbors and you're friends with them. So if you have legacy power, you know, I'll come talk to you in the neighborhood. Say, hey, what's up, John? Get to know you a little bit. I'll go to the neighbor across the street and say, hey, what's up? I'm Mike. I'm with legacy power. Um, we're the ones following up on net metering. I'm actually friends with. So instead of saying I work with or we did solar for, hey, I'm friends with John Soriano. He's two doors down. So I'm friends with instead of like I work with or we did solar for. Tell the person where they live so you know where they live, right? It's not some weird made up name, right? Hey, John's a couple doors down. I don't know if you know him. And then say something specific about John that you'd only know if you really had a real interaction with him. He's has, he has two little kids. They're always running around their front yard. They have that white picket fence. Super nice family. Hey, I'm also friends with John Selby. He always use John. He, he, uh, he lives off Barona Mesa right here in Ramona. Um, he's just one street over from you. Um, and then he, he runs the greens committee for the golf course. You guys ever golf over here on the golf course, right? And so number one, this just applies to all sales. Like doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're door to door, learn how to create a bandwagon effect and name drop effectively. Yeah. Okay. Number one, number two, I think specifically to solar, okay? I think pest control, sell in the backyard, sell on the doorstep, like it's a 10 minute sale, right? I think for home security and I think for, um, for solar, I think the most underrated thing is getting inside the door. There's this bad habit that we have in solar where we're so scared to like transition into people's homes because we just wanna get a bill and feel good about getting a bill on the doorstep. Well, the problem with that is like how much trust do you actually have with someone and how much rapport if you haven't even been in their house? Wow. Are you actually gonna get a second appointment for yourself or for a closer? Probably not. And that's why we see a lot of like fall through from appointment or bill to second appointment. So one thing that I've always done, my goal of my door approach is to get inside the house. Anything that detracts from that, I'm not gonna pitch. Anything that can lead me up to that, I'm gonna pitch. And so as an example, I'll just give you kind of my transition, my solar transition. We don't, we don't have time to go through the whole pitch, but once I've gotten to the end of my transition or the end of my pitch, and remember guys, if your pitch, if you don't have an intro where you break preoccupation, you're name dropping effectively, if you're not leading with a problem, right? If you're just solution, benefit, benefit, benefit. If you're not leading with a problem, you need to do that. You need to have a clear solution to that problem and a concise and clear benefit to the customer. Wow. Sometimes people gloss over this. As soon as you drop a benefit, like, hey, it's fully funded, it's a flat rate for power. They're also adding a battery onto each home right now for homes that qualify. Immediately when you give that, you're gonna take away. Hey, the downside with this program, John, is that a lot of the homes that we look at, they don't qualify. As soon as you've done that, intro, problem, solution, benefit, takeaway, no matter what, I'm going for the transition every time. Because if I can get in the house, the credibility and the trust and the rapport is gonna go through the roof. Right. My transition, okay, I'm gonna give you guys the secret to life right now. I'm gonna get you in so many homes, okay? This is free advice, okay? Hey, my job is super simple. What I'm going to do today is I'm gonna leave you some notes inside on a corner of your table. I'm gonna write down what the qualifications are for the program and some program notes. And then on my way out, I'll let you know when we're coming back with the results for all the homes in the street. So that's it. I'm pretty much done. I don't have a, a ton of time today. I gotta be kind of quick, um, but I just need a table and a chair real quick to jot these notes down and then I'll get out of your hair. Shoes on or off. And look down and wipe your feet, right? If you're brand new, that's gonna be intimidating. You're like, I'm not gonna get in the house. Like, I'm gonna just ask for the bill. It's like, what's the end goal? It's to get glass on the roof. Right. In my first visit, the higher trust and credibility that I can build 
and the more pain and value that I can build, the higher likelihood that customer is gonna go to install. Last thing, when you get in a house, that's when people actually start to give you their real objections. On the door, there is just like smoke screen, smoke screen, smoke right. screen. Once you're in at a table, they got you a glass of water and a cookie, okay? Now they're like, you know what, Mike? Mm -hmm. We looked into solar two years ago. It doesn't make sense for us to buy panels because we're on the medical baseline. <laughs> Boom, now I'm selling, right? Yeah. Now I'm actually selling, selling and creating selling value. Selling doesn't really begin until objections come up and that's good and I, I never even thought about it like that. You know, as you're talking, it reminds me of how I learned this. Uh, there was this book called Pitch Anything. Yeah, remarkable Love book. Love that book. And he talks about how there's the croc brain, the mid brain, the neocortex, right? And the neocortex, that's where we make all our decisions from, right? Yeah. And a lot of the times when we're knocking on the doors, we think we're pitching to the neocortex, right? right? But we're actually pitching to the croc, the croc brain, yeah. which is the part of the brain that is simply assessing the information and being like, are you a threat or are you a guest? Right? Do I need to kill you, eat you, or run away? Right? <laughs> that's literally that's it's a primal, obviously, way of thinking. But that is what the croc brain is doing. So when you're in that state of mind, yeah, you're not going to give out certain information. You're not going to talk about why you didn't go solar six months right. ago, a year ago. But you're right. The moment you shift in the home, something clicks in their brain because you don't invite somebody in their home if you think they're a threat. Remember, the croc brain is trying to think: Are you a threat? They're assessing. They're like, I don't know. Let's see. Are you a threat? And you know, oh, you are. A threat boom shut the door oh you're not a threat okay come on in and the moment you're in you that's how you can go from the croc brain yep. to the neocortex and that's where you can start having actual real conversation because now they don't see you as a threat and it's beautiful how it works because yes i know a mistake i've made many times is i'm trying to have a rational conversation with the croc brain on the door on the doors when i should be having it with the neocortex right but the the most effective way to get to that part of the brain is inside the home. Yeah, and when I get an objection, I'm just like, hey, sir, I don't wanna to talk to your crock brain. So if you could just activate the neocortex. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it works every Imagine. time, just like, do okay, it. Okay, cool, yeah. Someone record that and send it to General John. Yeah. Let's see what kind of Come responses on. we get. That's funny. Dude, speaking of uh, the first one, name dropping, uh, uh, I want to share a funny story. There was one time where I was totally BSing a name drop, right? And this guy, this you guy, it, no, you can't do it. Don't do it. This is like two years in solar. I was new. All right. Don't judge me. But I, I will never forget this. And I never did it again since this guy literally was like, oh, wh who's the neighbor? And I was like, oh yeah, you know, Mike, like down the street. Oh, can, can you point to his house for me? And then I'm like, oh shoot. And he then I'm you. like, yeah, he got me. And I'm like, I like, we walked down the driveway and I'm like, oh, it's like that house over there. And I don't know if he was just like BSing me now, but then he goes, oh, okay. Yeah. You know what? That's the only neighbor I don't know. And this guy had been in the neighborhood for like 20 years. So he said, he knew, every, he knew he's like, yeah, they just moved in a few months ago. And I'm just like, Oh, I dodged that bullet. Cause imagine I go like, oh yeah, that one. He's like, really? Like, cause I know Dylan lives there. And ever since then, I was like, I'm never gonna name drop it like just to name drop. Cause a lot of guys do that. Well, it's, they it's, make a, oh yeah, you know, Sally down the street, like she's, you know, seven streets over. It's like, dude, everyone, everyone can read through you. They know you're BSing them. You know, sales is a transfer of energy, right? Like, but the way you do it, it's so authentic and it comes off as, like you said, you give data, you give so much intimate data to where the homeowner knows that, okay, this guy is not a pest in our neighborhood. Right. He's actually someone that is a part of the neighborhood and it works. Right. Hey, most of your neighbors know me already. Yeah, you know, I've been out here for a while now. Most of your neighbors know me already. I'm friends with so-and-so, friends with so-and-so. They live off this street. They drive the big white truck. You've seen the pickup truck in their driveway with the big lifted tires. Yeah. Um, they're on the corner here with the white picket fence, whatever. Like make it specific, you know, mm -hmm. and don't BS. No, of course. And it works well because in sales, you know, uh, Jordan Belford talks about the, the three tens. Okay, you're selling yourself, you're selling your company, and you're selling the product. Right. And I've discovered that if you can sell yourself really well, if people can be like, okay, I can trust this guy, this guy's a subject matter expert, you know, you can actually rank a little bit lower on the product and the company and they will still go with you. Right. But if you rank low on like, I don't know if I trust this guy, no. is he like a, uh, what do they call it, a, uh, like fly by fly night by kind night. of guy, right? You could have the best product, you could, have, you could have the best company, they may not go with you because they don't know they can trust you. So right. you do it in such a way where like, whenever you come back, there's already such high level of trust and trust is the currency in business. Right. 
you will you will not do business with anyone if you don't trust them. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because one of the thoughts I had when you're talking about name dropping and like BSing is that a lot of the younger guys in sales, they feel like they have to like exaggerate things or like use little white lies or whatever yeah. like throughout their sales process. And anytime I hear it, I just, I call it out. And I used to do that when I was 23 too. You know, um, and maybe it's not just a younger guy thing, but maybe it's like an inexperienced sales guy where you feel like you need to like make up for your lack of experience. Like, hey, just tell the truth. Be blunt, be honest and say it in a way with good energy and confidence. You don't need to like make things up. You don't need to like BS people. They will see right through that every time, yeah. you know? So just be honest. I've done a thousand installs and I've never had to tell someone that, oh yeah, like you can take panels off the roof if you don't like it. Right. You know what I mean? You just don't yeah. have to do any of that stuff. Yeah. So you don't want to get caught in that stuff. And I like that because that's one of my missions, right? As to why even I started this podcast is to show people that you can, that sales can be a, such a great industry. Cause right now there's this connotation in society that if you do sales, like, oh, that means you have to lie. That means you have to be sleazy. That means you gotta be arrogant, right? Yeah. But you know, really a, a big reason for this podcast is to show people, to bring people on that have done remarkable things, but they operate out of integrity. Yeah. They operate out of honor, right? They don't lie. They, they're willing to have hard conversations with yeah. people. Like, yeah, if someone says, hey, what happens if I don't want it? You tell them like, hey, the only way you can get them off is you have to pay it off, right? But you explain to them though how you're gonna like the product so much that you won't even think about taking it off. Right. So because that's been my also experience as well. That hey, when you're actually honest with people, um, people like can pick up can people can pick up on that and they'll be like, okay, cool, I I want to go solar with you. Yeah, and not to jump around, but you made me think of something that's really prevalent in all the industries, um, and it's cancel closing. Okay. There's a lot of people just made me think of that. Like yeah, when you have like people have those hard objections, then the immediate reaction of the salesperson is like, well, you have up until install to think about it. Or yeah, you can cancel this anytime before install. Mm. It's like, no, if you're getting hard objections during your close, what you need to do, that's a yellow light. You need to slow down. Wow. You need to like close the iPad and be like, hey, if you're not comfortable with this, then we shouldn't do this. But there's no answer that does, there's no question that doesn't have a good answer. Right. So like, what what are you concerned with exactly? Cause you, you ask about canceling, like I don't wanna do this if you're just gonna cancel two days from now, let's just yeah. not do this. But w what are you concerned about? Well, you know, Mike, I just, I want to look into buying it, right? And it's like, man, they haven't brought that up the whole sales presentation. You've given them options, but now that you're going to sign stuff, they're like, well, I want to look into buying it. Instead of just cancel closing and be like, yeah, you can look into those options. Like, no, close your binder. You need to close them once and you're here now. So close them here now. Like don't put off the close, right? Well, if you were to look into buying something, okay, if you were to look into buying panels, how much do you think it would cost, right? And now you get into like why most of the neighbors aren't buying anymore. Interest rates have gone up, dealer fees have gone up. It's more expensive to take out a loan. Interest rates have shot up substantially. They're four, five, six percent. They used to be two percent, right? And I can go through all my all my reasons why no one's buying right now and why a power purchase agreement makes the most sense. Right. And now I close that customer and it's buttoned up instead of me leaving all these loose ends because I was too scared right. to like face the objection. Like you got to step up and actually close them and like face the objections. Yes. This isn't solar isn't a sale where you can just breeze through objections. Yeah. I think some sales satellite pests, it's like, dude, you're just weaving. Yeah. Right. It's like bop, weave, yeah. like redirect. Right. I think when you're in the house, when you're on the door with solar, that's how I treat it. Yeah. I'm just I'm just bobbing and weaving because my only goal is to get in the dang house. OK. But once I'm in the house and we're going over their bill and I'm explaining the problem with the utility company, I actually want to draw out every objection exactly. because they're going to have four weeks to think about it. And so if I don't answer or overcome those objections, who are they going to go to? Yeah. Who are they gonna go to, guys? Their neighbor, their neighbor Billy Bob, who built his own system. He wear, you know, he wears the overalls, no shirt, and he like put up his own panels. That's who they're gonna ask. Yeah, you they're don't from like panels from the '90s. Yeah, well, you don't want Bill, you don't want Billy Bob answering your your customers' yeah. questions about a PPA. Yeah. You want to be the one to do it. So slow down, learn not to cancel close, and when you get that like itch to cancel close, that's a sign that you haven't overcome 
and drawn out their real objections. Yeah. So back up, slow down, close the iPad and get the objections out. Yeah, and I think a big reason of that is we have this false kind of uh, um, sense of accomplishment right. that we feel like when we get the sale, it feels almost just as good right. as getting an install. Yeah. If anything, actually, I usually feel better when I get the sale Way better. than when I get the install. Like the day the panels go up or the days I actually get paid, I'm not like, let's go. But when I get the sale, I'm like, yes, it's like, that come dopamine, on, let's dude. go. Yeah, it's so, that dopamine so I think we like believe that that's when in reality, right, we need to practice hard things and yeah. delay and have delay gratification. A one-liner that I've always used, that I think has helped me a lot with, um, um, having attrition, like high attrition with my customer base has been, you know, because of course we have to talk about the cancellation policies per the CPUC. But when I get to the part, I go like, hey, listen, these are your cancellation policies. Um, but Mike, if you're going to cancel, let's just not even start anyways. And I have like a two second pause I, I was, when I'm going through that. I'm like, hey, so this is your cancellation policy. You can cancel up until blah, 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 you know. Uh, but if you think you're going to cancel, let's just not even start. Yeah. And then I pause. And that pause is a way where they will, if they have objections, they will bring it up. I've had one person that actually, in that moment, I paused and he was like, actually, John, um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm not ready yet. And then it, I was, it was an opportunity where I was able to address what his objection was. And had I not done that there, right, right I would have signed him up, gotten the boom, got in the, the dopamine hit. And then right. a week later or two days later, uh, hey, I want to cancel, you know, so because you're right, like you need to, they need to be closed right then and then. Right. Not like, oh yeah, you have until final design. Like some guys will be like, oh, you have until final design to think about it. Like, no, no, no. No, like, close it. Like you, we're, we're, there's there's two yeses, right? The homeowner saying yes, and then us as a company it's saying on yes. Us. And then they should be saying yes there. You then say yes or no after site survey. Yeah, we're just gonna like, let you know. Yeah, like, hey, I hope you pass, Mike. I hope, you know, and then like I, another thing too is I don't leave saying thank you. I'm not like, hey, Mike, dude, yeah, thanks yeah. for your business, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank right, you. Because right, right. what that does is I just gave you the power. Right. Where instead, when at least when I leave the home, I'll I'm like, let you know. hey, I'll let mm -hmm. you know, Mike. I, I hope it all works out. I yeah. hope your I hope your house passes, you know, um, but we'll, we'll see when we get there. And then now you leave and they're, they're not thinking, do I want to go solar? Now they're like, oh, honey, I hope we pass, right. you know, when... We know most of the time they will, but it's it's framed differently, yeah. you know, as opposed to like, cool, well, I know I can get it. And then when you when you know you can get something, right. you want it less. Okay. But when you know that you may not want to be able to get something, right. now you want it all of a sudden more. It's all the frame you put the customer in, right? Like you can create an analytical frame if you're like pulling up spreadsheets with the customer. You actually create that for the customer. Mm. Like you're, if you're selling analytically, you'll create more analytical customers, right? Yeah. And so the way that I frame it, and you, it sounds like you're in the same boat, is I'll say something like, hey, if, if the home qualifies, John, like if we're actually able to do this for you and we're able to come and pay for everything to go up, lock in your rate at 31 cents, protect you against future inflation, like if we're able to do all that at no cost, do you see any reason that you wouldn't want to be part of the program? Frame it as a no, right? right. It's easier to say no than yes. No, we're good. Okay, cool. Well, I hope it works out for you. Exactly. We still need to do our due diligence and we don't know which homes will get approved or not for funding. Um, but what's gonna happen next is we're gonna fill out these three things. I'm gonna email them over to you. You've used DocuSign before, right? Right. Cool, we're gonna fill those things out and then they'll allow us to schedule a site survey. That's where we're gonna determine the eligibility. Oh. The nice thing is there's nothing you guys have to think about. Yeah. Either the home doesn't pass and we can't do this, which I'll let you know or it does and it's a no brainer. Wow. It's fully funded, it's a flat rate instead of time of use variable rates and it has rate protection for as long as you live in the home. Yeah. You know, it's like locking in your gas at two bucks and now the gas prices go up to six but you're locked in at two. Right. Would you have done that? Of course. Right. So it's like, oh. okay, how am I framing that with the customer? There's no, there's no option for them. Too many guys are like, yeah, hey, let's get the site survey done and then I'll come back and we'll review the results and you guys can decide if you, Dude, you already lost a sale. That's a cancel nine times out of 10. Yeah. Like you're cancel closing without even knowing it. That's the thing, a lot of guys do it without knowing it. Wow. You know? Yeah, that's good. And I promise you, if you can adopt these two things, the, or the really three things, the name dropping, right? The getting in the home, the don't cancel close, right? Close them right then and then. I mean, that alone will make you quarter million dollars plus, right? Easy. And make, if you're a leader, right? If your team adopts that, I mean, that's, dude, you, know, you, you should be charging like, 
50 grand for these classes like, hey, for free. Yeah. Should I be a consultant? I don't yeah, know. Right? Dude, uh, personal question I want to ask you is, uh, it's cool that, you know, you've accomplished a milestone of over a thousand, over a thousand installs. I, I'm sure there's a handful of guys only in the industry that have done that. Uh, but I've always wondered when you hit a thousand installs exactly, how did it feel? Were you like, eh, just another day? Or were you like, holy smokes? It like, felt, what was that day like Yeah, for you? it felt good, man. I think, you know, when you look back on a career, like that number, really what it represents, it's not the number. Really what it represents is a decade of consistency. Wow. A decade of like hard work and like knocking in the rain. When I was on Long, in, on Long Island, like knocking with snow boots in the snow, like we'd carry golf balls with us to knock the doors because it hurt to knock with your knuckles. It was negative 10. We'd go out, like I remember Hurricane um, Hurricane Katrina, right? Um, I think that's what it was called. Maybe it was a different one, but it was 2012, late 2012, and it ravaged like New Jersey and, and New York. I remember going out after like, like the way we looked at it was like, hey, everyone's home. Like we're gonna be empathetic to people, check on them, make sure they're good. And we're gonna talk to them about solar. And me and my buddy each sold like 10 that week. Wow. No one else was working. Our site surveys were next day. It was like amazing, right? But it's like, it, it, what a thousand means to me is a mentality that I've adopted. It's like blood, sweat, and tears. And so, yeah, like there is a sense of accomplishment there. Wow. And I think too, like people want to act like, yeah, like don't be proud. Don't like be humble. Like, yeah, of course, like I, I'm, I'm humbled and I couldn't have done it without all the help that I've gotten, but it's also good to like take a second and just like appreciate your successes too. Cause sometimes we're just like, like enjoy the journey, you know, like really look back and be like, wow, like I'm, I am proud of like the hard work that I've put in. What I'm more proud of is the people's lives that I've had the opportunity to help change. Right. Right. So that number's cool, but it represents a lot more than like an install number. Yeah. It, it, it represents a journey over a decade of working with a lot of different people and being a, able to help people kind of step up and reach their potential and have guys be managers that never thought they could be managers. And like, I've seen hundreds of people's lives change financially and not just financially, but like mentally, Yeah. like the mentalities that you develop in this industry will change your life forever, Yeah. you know, if you do it the right way. Right. And so, yeah, again, it's not just a number, it's not just a commission. It's like when I really think about a thousand, I think back over the last decade and I get emotional because it's been like a huge part of my life. Yeah. And it's it's relational. It's not just about the right. number, it's about the relationships and the time and the effort and like the unity that I've had with all my best friends are in the solar industry. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. It's uh I always say behind every number there's a story. Right. You know, I, uh, I'm, you know me, I'm a big numbers guy. Yeah. I'm very analytical the way I think. I like to like, I actually like to crunch math and you know, that's just like, I'm the guy that actually likes to read legal documents. <laughs> Anyways, but, uh, and I remember, or every time I review like my organization over the last few years, um, you know, I noticed that we've always doubled, yeah. right? And some people will just see like, oh, you just doubled, right? You grew hundred percent, whatever. But I always see, but for me, it's emotional, like you said, cause there's a story, yeah. right? And I think, we need to be proud of that. Like, yeah, there's a sense of, like, be proud of what you've accomplished. If it's 100 installs, if it's 50 installs, right? If it's 10 installs, if it's your first install. Right. Because I remember my first install, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget my first install. I remember I drove, I was Tier Santa. Tier Santa was my first install. Alan Wolf. Alan oh, and Michelle. Alan, shout Alan. out Alan. Actually, uh, Alan passed away oh, a year no. later. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> Awkward. All right. But Michelle, Michelle and Alan Wolf, that was my first install. And I remember I drove there and I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I like signed them up, didn't talk to them again. You know, again, a brand new in solar. And I remember driving there and just being like, please let there be panels. Please let there be panels because I got the install date. And I show up and I see panels and I remember I'm just in my car. Yes, yes, I did it. I was in solar for four months at that time, yeah, four yeah. months, first install, you know? And I was like, I did it, I can do this. And that number one, like people will just see number one. But for me, I saw a journey of learning the art of knocking, learning the art of appointment setting, learning the art of closing and all that. And, and, and so be proud, right? Like, I think that's a great point. It's like, uh, one install, 50, 1,000 sales, 10,000 sales, whatever, like recognize that there's a story behind that and be yeah. proud of that story right. and let that story continue to allow you to grow even more. Yeah. 
you know, because it's it's so cool, right? I mean, there'll be a day where you help another person get maybe a thousand insoles and there's a story behind that. So, dude, so awesome. So Mike, in our closing few minutes here, you know, um, I think a lot of people that'll be tuning in recognize the remarkable uh, career you've had. What kind of advice would you give them, whether it's a sales advice or solar advice, yeah. but you know, you're a man, you're, I, I think you're a very rare man, right? In this industry, not many people have accomplished what you've done personally, but also have accomplished it with consistency. One thing I've admired about you is you've been consistent over a long period of time. And that's a rare thing to find in this space. But uh, what, what advice would you give people out there, man? Like what closing remarks would you like to add? Yeah, the thing that comes to mind is two things. Um, commitment, number one. Like no matter what you're doing, commit 100%. Don't be like one foot in, one foot out. You know, there's that story about burning the ships, right? Like the Spaniards went to conquer Mexico and they brought like dozens of warships. They got off their warships and then the leader of the army is like, burn the ships. Like in other words, we're conquering this land like we're conquering or we're dying. And I think having that mentality, like, hey, no matter what, if I'm in the solar industry or if I'm in, if I'm getting into sales, having that burn the ships mentality is going to allow your brain to focus on finding solutions instead of excuses. Wow. Because that, that's the problem. When you're not committed, you find excuses. You find reasons why you can't. When you're 100% committed and you're like, I'm gonna do this for five years, like I'm gonna work in sales the rest of my life, like I'm gonna figure this out. I've evaluated the opportunity, it's a great opportunity, I'm gonna get in it and take advantage. Like commit 100%, that's it, that's number one, okay? Um, number two is learn to lean into friction and in, enjoy the process. Right? Don't just focus on the end goal. I see so many people come into solar, they have one big quarter. And the reason is they're like, I'm gonna knock doors so that I can, like I'm gonna put up with knocking so that I can hit 20 installs in a quarter. And you see those guys come in, they hit 20, whew, they're done. Okay, if that same guy had said, hey, I'm gonna knock every day because I wanna learn to do hard things. I wanna to learn to become like an amazing salesman and an amazing communicator and learn how to articulate concepts and beliefs and ideas. And I wanna become an amazing persuader. And I, I'm gonna like learn to love this craft and like I'm gonna study every day, I'm gonna outwork everyone because I'm someone who does hard things. That guy is in the industry a decade Come on. and having success. And not only is he in the industry a decade, but every day he goes to work, he's grateful for it because that's his mentality. Right? If you're in the former, right? If you're in your head like, I have to do this, like I have to eat my broccoli so I can get my ice cream, you're gonna hate your broccoli, right? And so what you need to do is learn to love the process. So commit 100%, burn your dang ships, okay? And then learn to love and do hard things. Learn to love and do hard things. If you do those two things, you learn to lean into friction and create dopamine based on your effort, like your life will change forever. Not just in this industry, but in your life. Yeah. Like every single thing, like lean into trials, lean into obstacles, learn to love friction. Come on. That's it. That's it. It's that's your identity. You've done it. Yes. It's, it's who, who you are. are. That's yes. it. And that's the journey we're all on, right? And the Do Hard Things podcast is all about teaching people that, hey, like life is hard, yeah. but if you learn, actually being broke is hard, being rich is hard. Having a good body is hard. Having an overweight body is hard. Being Having a good marriage is hard. Having a bad marriage is hard. At the end of the day, it's up to us to choose what kind of hard we want. And I want the kind of hard that's going to make me a better person, not going to make my life harder, right? And Les Brown, he always said, you know, in life, if you do what is easy, then life becomes actually hard. Right. But if you do first what is hard, life eventually becomes easy, right? Yeah. Only because you become the man or the woman that can sustain that you become the person where now for you, once upon a time, knocking doors is hard. Right. Now it's so a part of who you are that it's easy. Like you don't even think twice. You're just like, no, this is who I am, right? And so, dude, it's awesome. I mean, that's the phenomenal advice. And you have something to say? I was just gonna, I was yeah, laughing. Go ahead, go I was go laughing out. because I, I was doing like some admin stuff that I needed to do like okay. for three or four hours yesterday. And it was so hard for me. And I was just thinking like, gosh, I, 
like selling so easy. I just get <laughs> yeah, on the doors yeah. and I'm in my flow state. It's yeah. like now I have to like shift and adjust as I as I change kind of like um, my stewardships, yeah. you know. And it's it's all different, but you know I gotta learn. I gotta learn yeah. to love that. So I'm preaching to myself Come too. On. So but you're building, man. So guys, thank you for tuning in to this week's podcast uh, with the legend, Mike Brand. I wish I could give you some uh, Instagram handles or social media accounts to follow Mike Brand, but he is actually non-existent Not as yet. of now on uh, on social media. But uh, maybe we should start like a, um, a GoFundMe account to go help Mike get on social media. But uh, guys, thank you for tuning in. I really hope at the end of the day that you guys take this advice and apply it. Uh, one of the greatest ways you guys can show appreciation for the people we have on this podcast is by actually executing on what they talk about. Mike is an individual who has accomplished great things, uh, but he didn't do it. He didn't get lucky, right? He just applied a few principles in his life and he stayed consistent with it. And that can be you as well. So Get out there, make it happen, go do hard things, and we'll catch you at the next podcast. Do hard things. Let's get it. Go.